ancient warriors, prophets, kings, politics, conspiracies. No, this is just thousands of years of truth and history. It's the word of God. And I'm Wade. And I'm Jen. And join us as we add oil to our lamps, learning from and applying the Holy Scripture to our lives. As we go, as we set out in a dark world and uncover the things that want to remain hidden by shining the light of Christ. Awake, O sleeper. This is out of the darkness. In this episode, we continue where we left off with Bridge. We touch on the differences between the Holy Spirit and the false spirit that is running rampant in the church. We also go into spiritual abuse and what we should do if we find ourselves in a church that is spiritually abusive. We hope that this episode blesses you as much as it did us. Grace and peace, fam. When we talk about love, when the world talks about love, love is something that is flowery. It's something that is accepting. It's something that is void of discipline. It's void of correction. And that is not love. Sometimes the most loving thing we we can do for each other is tell the truth because love can feel unloving. Sometimes the greatest way that we can show that we love somebody is to say, what are you doing? And expose and hold them accountable to the very thing that they're doing that is actually pulling them away from the true love. And it can hurt, but it will never harm. And there's a huge difference between hurting and harming that the world has all upside down and inside out and jumbled up. People think that if you hurt their feelings that you've harmed them because you've exposed the darkness within, that they're not willing to admit is dark. They want to call it light. But when you expose that and you shine the actual true light upon it, It's just like what the, what demons do. They scream in agony. And it can hurt. But just as when you go to a dentist and they're working on your teeth and they're filling a cavity, it's for your benefit. It's not for your detriment. It may hurt you, but it will heal you. It will never harm you. Yet on the flip side and in the contrary, if we sit here and we just pour out this this pseudo love upon each other to give each other all of this flowery feeling and and all of these these, uh, butterflies in our stomach and, and make everything roses and daisies to make somebody feel good about themselves, to build up their ego, to make them feel like they're okay, even though they are walking down the path of destruction, we are doing the most unloving act 
because we are leading them to destruction. We're killing them. And that's where everything is upside down and inside out. True love isn't more concerned about your emotions as it is about your salvation. It never seeks to berate you. That's not loving. But when it tells you a firm truth without using any sort of derogatory uh, ridicule, it's just giving you facts. No, that is not real. That is not true. And this is why. What you're doing is not okay. When you do it in that kind of manner, that's loving. But the world calls that hate speech. Yet what do they do? On the flip side, they turn right around and they ridicule you. And they do the abusive speech against you and annihilate you. And yet they call themselves the loving ones. Here they are, filling people's heads with false hopes, false dreams, emotion, euphoria, all the things that tickle your senses and tickle your ears and stroke your ego. And kill you softly. And then when the love of truth comes and says, what are you doing? Get off that path. You're walking down the road of destruction. And there's no turning back if you go too far. Because the Lord will hand you over to the desires of your heart. And the enemy will have its way with you. And you will be left with nothing but torment. Yeah, you know, absolutely. And and kind of going back to that, um, the cavity, right? The cavity analogy. Like um, the people that are supposedly loving and stuff like that, um, that worldly that worldly love they're they're just going to offer you like candy because you know here's some candy for your cavity because it tastes good it feels good but no you don't need to get that you don't need to get that tooth work done here just just eat this candy oh no that's bad that's evil mm-hmm. that will hurt you right yeah exactly and it's the message of the NAR it's the message of the word um, more to face movement. It's the message of the hyper charismatics. It's the message of basically non-denominational. It's in all of your mainstream, no matter what type of sect of Christianity you're in, it's there. It has infiltrated into every single one of them. And when you call somebody out on the behaviors that they're doing, then people will actually attack you and say, what? that's so cruel. That's so mean that you would say something like that. Yet when that person comes at you and they absolutely annihilate you and ridicule you, those same people will look at you and say, oh, you need to have grace on them. They're going through a hard time. Oh, they just need to experience love. It's like, I'm sorry, what? I do what's loving and I speak truth and I'm speaking it in love. I'm not belittling them. I'm not berating them. I'm not ridiculing them. I'm just saying what they're doing is not okay. And you're telling me that's cruel. And that I'm the one who's now being intolerant. And I'm the one who is now not walking in grace and mercy and forgiveness. But this person over here is is annihilating me every chance they get. And you want to defend them. And you want to enable them and say that they're just going through a hard time. Oh, they didn't mean it. That's not what they meant. 
Really? That doesn't make any sense. But that's how it works in the world. And that's how it works in the church. Everything is about the path of least resistance. They will come against those they feel are easier to control, are easier to listen, are easy because they know that that person really is empathetic and compassionate. And so they're easier to subdue than the one that they know they will experience the wrath of if they try to go against them. And they don't want to experience the wrath, so they'll do it against you because they know that you're not going to give them wrath. That right there is the work of the enemy. That's him orchestrating that. And most of the time, people don't have a clue they're doing what they're doing. And it, it's all chalked up to the Lord forgive them for they don't know what they do. They think that they're using wisdom and they are absolutely clueless. And they're leading that person to destruction. And they're also leading this other person who's trying to speak the truth. They're gaslighting them and they're causing them to doubt everything that they know and everything that they're actually believing to be true and knowing to be true and which truly is true. And they're leading them astray. So that they doubt it and they, they don't know what to believe anymore. Because it doesn't just come from one person. It comes from everybody around them. They all say the same thing. What the heck? How can everybody be wrong and I be right? Lord, what is going on? I just can't speak anymore because I must be getting it wrong. That's the number one goal of the enemy. And we're seeing that on a massive scale. That's what MK Ultra looks like in a spiritual sense. You know, I was going to ask, because you're talking like someone who has maybe been well acquainted with the NAR. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, at least with the, um, like, they'll never call themselves NAR. Right. You know, they, they deny that that term even exists. Mm -hmm. But it's definitely with the charismatic. Yeah. For sure. I've heard the spirit behind that movement called different things. But I'm going to ask you, what is it? So are you saying, are, are you referring to the spirit behind of it called being called like the Kundalini spirit? Sure. And that sort of thing? Yeah. Those are all basically um, like arbitrary names that are given because of different areas of the world in which that's how they're referred to. And so just like Baal, Baal is, has a different name in different regions of, of different nation, nations, right? So it's basically, it's the same spirit, many different names. Mm. It all gets chalked up to, it's the counterfeit Holy Spirit. That's what it is. We can call it the Kundalini because we can see it manifest itself in the Hindu religion. When they're in their prayer rooms and things like that, and they're on their mats, what they do, you can put two videos side by side of a um, a Hindu prayer thing and an NAR um, people 
being drunk in the spirit and them doing what they do, it looks identical. Riding around, uncontrollable body movement, laughing uncontrollably, sounding like farm animals, screaming, uh, flopping around on the floor, and there is no difference. And you want to know what their, the, the Christian world's response is to that? Who practice those things? Oh, it's just because the enemy is the counterfeit. So of course it's going to look similar. It's like, no. So how do we know? Right? How do we know that, that what's going on over here in Hinduism is not the same or is the same as what's going on in the charismatic world. How, how do we know what's what? The most glorious thing is the Lord tells us. And what he tells us is what the fruits of the Spirit are. Mm. It's love, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness. And what's the most important one when it comes to this? Self-control. Self-control. Mm-hmm. You nailed it, Jen. Self-control. When we are not acting in self-control, there is something wrong. And that is why, circling back, oh, oh my gosh, I just sounded like the whole sake check. Sorry. You can cut that out, Jen. <laughs> and circle back. <laughs> you have to circle back to We're going to have to We're circle back. We're circling back now. <laughs> <laughs> to what you were saying earlier, Jen, about... Um, how do, like, when I was talking about the, the feelings and how that's actually a red flag for me, the reason why it's a red flag for me is because I have encountered that me too. counterfeit Holy Spirit. I have felt it. Mm. I'm so glad that you I, brought that up. Yeah, I know what that feels like. I, I have been, I've engaged with it, not knowing what it was. Mm-hmm. Me too. And, you know, and I will never forget. I'm sorry, Jen, go ahead. Oh, no. what? oh I'll go ahead. Um, but for me, I will never forget when the Lord brought me into this realm. At first, I thought because they all claim to see things spiritually, they, they all know about spiritual warfare. I had no idea anybody on the planet for 10 years. I didn't know a soul. I didn't even know the term spiritual warfare. I didn't even know it had a term. And then I met somebody who said, oh, yeah, that's called spiritual warfare. And they did this over here. And I was like, what? Come again? People know this? I'm not alone? What do you mean? I must know more and I must know who these people are and I must find my people. (laughs) Is what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. I actually have people out there. This is amazing. And, um, and so when I, I started meeting, you know, and, and I found out about a church in my local area. And so I started going there and I was like, oh, my gosh, this is just like epiphany. Like, oh, I finally found my way home. And then things started to happen. I started grieving. And I couldn't figure out why the heck I was grieving. I knew it wasn't coming from me, but I'm bawling my eyes out. I'm on my face. Everybody around me is jumping up and, and being all crazy and, you know, getting drunk in the spirit. And they're dancing around and doing their thing. And I'm in the back bawling. And I'm like, Lord, why do I feel such grief? And here we go again with, it must be me. Because how come all of these people who claim to know you and love you and be so close to you and, and, and know all of these truths that I didn't even know anybody knew? How come they're doing this joyous stuff and I'm back here feeling the weight of your grief? I don't, I don't get this. This doesn't make sense to me. And, 
it was because they were all engaging in the counterfeit. Like the Lord would have, like he used to have me do things that were very uncomfortable because it put me in front of everybody and I didn't like that. And this is when I would, I was like Jeremiah and I would argue with the Lord every time I would go to church and tell him, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing it today. You can find somebody else. Not today, sir. (laughs) (laughs) You know, and that's just me and my flesh crying out. I don't want to. Can you please do it with somebody else today? Can they just do it? And the Lord was always, and he's always, I mean, just so gentle. And he almost always never had to say a word. It just felt like he, he put his hand on like the small of my back and he would just like, give me this look. It's hard to describe, you know, because it's the Lord, but I would feel this like look looking at me just like, okay, go ahead now. <laughs> oh my God. Really? I have to? Okay. Oh dear. But this is what did happen. When I would follow through and I would do what the Lord was asking me to do, at the end of service, everything would change. I would see things in the spiritual realm as I was doing it, so I wasn't even hardly here. My body was here, but I wasn't here. And then you... Uh, almost always at the end of the service, people would come up to me and say, I, I don't know what the heck it is, but every time you, you go forward, you bring in the power of the Holy Spirit and everything changes. And I'm like, that's not me. <laughs> don't look at me. You know, that's, that's the Lord wanting you guys to come into his presence and that's all I know. And it would, it would totally shift. And uh, so that went on for a while. And then I would go to conferences and things like that. And then the Lord would show me all of this stuff. And I'm like, what? I don't understand. How come nobody else is, why aren't you telling anybody else this stuff? Why are you only telling me? Don't they love you? Don't they want you? Don't they, I mean, the way it looks is like you are their end all be all. They they don't want anything else but you. But what I'm getting from you is the exact opposite of what's going on here. Help. And all of it was training ground. I had to know it intimately in order to be able to describe what it is that feeling, that euphoria, that drawing in to get you to lose self-control. That's the counterfeit Holy Spirit. And it is so seductive, and it is so uncanny how close it is to the real thing. I mean, really uncanny. But the telltale sign is in your emotions. You can get emotions with the Lord, but it's different. When you are walking in the Holy Spirit and you're getting the emotion from the Lord in the Holy Spirit, it drives you to self-control. It doesn't have you lose it. Never will the Lord have you writhing around on the ground, screaming and looking like you're in agony. Or laughing uncontrollably. With the Lord, there's peace. With the counterfeit, it's a, it's chaos. It really is like you're drunk. Because you do not have control over your own members. And by members, I mean members of your body, not members of the congregation. You, you you don't you don't you don't think that way, and the euphoria is so intense. 
And that is what people encounter when they're going through Hinduistic meditations and all of that kind of stuff. They get that euphoria. It's a common uh, thread is that euphoria. And so when you're experiencing an uncontrollable euphoria, repent, rebuke it, renounce it. Say, get behind me, Satan. Heck no. We won't go. I'm not following this. But it is extremely difficult to kind of snap yourself out of um, at the beginning because you're like, I don't understand. This feels so great. This is so incredible. This feels so amazing. You just feel like God's love is all pouring through you and and it, it's it's mind blowing and blah blah blah, but it's it's not the Lord at all. And that's what's really hard trying to convince people that are in these types of um, churches, gatherings, what have you, that they're not experiencing the Lord is like trying to take candy away from a baby. Or I should say a two-year-old because that's a lot harder. Babies don't eat candy. (laughs) You know what I have have noticed because um, Wade and I have a similar story because we were um, in a church that was heavily NAR for a lack of a better word. Um, and we have like when they had like revivals and, and things like that, we have witnessed that and that euphoria that you're talking about. Absolutely. Um, and like, it feels good. It feels like amazing. And it, it does, does um, cause you to feel like a drunken state. And um, like I have multiple times um, went to the Lord after it was revealed to us, you know, like what this is and that it is a false, um, a false spirit. And I've went to the Lord many times and like just asked him, like, what was the point of me even going there and feeling that Mm -hmm. like I I don't you know that's something it even embarrassed me before like when I've like talked about it and um it's the same thing like what you said it's like so that you'll know um Mm -hmm. that these people are under a spiritual delusion type of thing Um, that there is a spiritual component with it. It's not just them, you know, acting all goofy. Like there is something there that is influencing. Um, and so it, it was just, um, I'm glad you touched on that because I've had that uh, similar experience. Yeah, it's like what uh, I was reading er- earlier about Deuteronomy 13. When he says, if somebody prophesies or is a dreamer of dreams and it comes to pass, and then they want to lead you and tell you to worship other gods, that's exactly what that is. And the Lord is testing us to see whether we actually love him with all of our heart and with all of our soul. And when we truly want him and we don't just want this emotion, we don't just want what we want to believe is him. That is what differentiates it. Mm. But the most grieving part about that aspect is the fact that all of these people really don't want him. They don't want, the true because they like the euphoria more. Yeah, exactly. And then once you feel that and you're, um, you want more and it's like a drug. And so then you want every time, um, like 
you thinking that you're going to be in his presence, you have to have that feeling. You have to, you know what I mean? Like that's what you're yep. craving instead of the truth. Exactly. And you're right. It is like a drug. It is insatiable. And that's why they're always going after the next prophet. They're always seeking the next word. They're always wanting to know what, what next conference there is so that they can all gather to get it again. It's how they get their fix. What does the Lord say again? So where's, give me a word of the Lord. That's why they teach people to prophesy. Because everybody's hungry for someone to tell them something that they want to hear. And it is an utter abomination. And those are the ones the Lord says, remove the wicked man from among you. And it's so hard because you look at the person. You can have a, a, an actual relationship with all of these people. You can really care about every single one of them because I can tell you how many people I utterly love that are caught up in this and I couldn't save them. I couldn't get them out of it. Here goes the gaslighting by proxy. They all join together because they're all on the same page. I'm the one who's different. So I have to be the one who's wrong. And they don't have ears to hear or a heart to respond. And it's like, how is that possible? Why? But scripture says it right there. They don't love him more. They just pretend like they do. They want the feeling. They want the experience. They want to see the miracles because then they feel powerful. They want to be the performer of the miracles and the signs and the wonders. Because then they feel like they're the ones who have the power of the Almighty. It's all about their own control, which is why they're going around decreeing this and decreeing that and claiming that their words have power. That they're the ones who have the power to speak things into existence because they have the faith to do so. That whatever they decree shall come to pass because they've been given that authority. And that is a lie from the pit of hell. There's one thing I am so grateful for. That God is so omniscient that he has the wisdom and the omnipresence to know there's no way he could give us that kind of power. Praise God, my words don't have that power because, man, I would have destroyed so much by now. <laughs> because I would be decreeing this and decreeing this and decreeing this and decreeing this. But then you have to, you run into the issue of one person over here is decreeing all of these things, whereas the other person perceives it in a different way and they're decreeing all these things. So who wins? Now you have the decreeing battle. <laughs> the most powerful will win. <laughs> I know. Who determines that? You know? And it, it is. It's all a matter of and when you actually break this all down as to why these people feel the need for it, it's because they want power. Absolutely. They want control. They don't like the fact that we live in a world where we don't get to control things because everybody has a free will. But here they are decreeing X, Y, and Z, which now is going to actually infringe upon somebody's free will. That's the insanity of it all. 
Or they think that they can make the cancer go away because, oh, miracles. God wants to heal everybody. And if you just have enough faith, then, then you're going to be healed. Um, if that were true, nobody would die. Paul never would have gone through what he went through, first of all. So are you saying Paul had horrible faith? Because Paul was jailed? Paul was beaten? He had so many lashes upon him, his flesh. He's been stoned so many times. He's been shipwrecked. If it was just a matter of faith to ensure that none of these things happen, man, why the heck do we have a Bible that has a New Testament that is primarily written by Paul? Because he had no faith at all, according to that definition. Neither did the first century Christians, by the way, who were all thrown into the Colosseum and fed to the lions. Where were their faith? Because according to this doctrine, you can decree all of these things because the Lord gives you the power to do so. So why didn't they just decree that another angel come and release them all from jail like the angel did for Peter? And save and get saved and, and not be mauled by lions and have to watch their children be mauled by lions too. It doesn't add up. But who is about power and control? Whose makeup is that? It's not the Lord's. The Lord does not rule by Machiavellian fear. He rules by love. Erasmus talked about that. The difference between Machiavellian and Erasmus. One rules by fear, power and control, and one rules by love. And the irony is that the world responds to the Machiavellian more so than the Erasmus. Because fear is a very potent weapon. Everybody's trying to save their own skin and protect their own hide. And so, when you break down the NAR and the charismatic realm, that is word of faith, faith. And of course, you have the crazies out there with the prosperity doctrine. I mean, that's like yeah. NAR, charismatic, all rolled into one, but at the same time, they, they take it to a whole nother level. But when you break the, the all of these ideologies down, the actual root of it is control. With enough faith, you have the power to control your destiny. You have the power to control everything that goes on around you. You have the power to rebuke this, to declare this, to renounce that, and put a bubble around yourself. Because it's all about your faith. So cancer, you don't exist anymore because I decreed it. Every ailment is gone. In the name of Jesus because I decreed it to be so. Because the Lord wants to heal everyone. That's actually his goal. That's his aim. And that's what they have people believing. But who is really the one who is the most drunk on that power? It's the one who's standing at the front of the stage up there 
mm. with the microphone, all eyes are on them, getting all the shouts of the hallelujah, amen. Mm. And they're getting drunk off that power. They're feeling pretty darn important. Like it's because of them that people get healed. It's because of them that people follow them. Because of them that people flock to the next gathering. They'll never admit it. But that's the reality behind it. Because when you look at them, they live a very worldly life. They have mansions and they live in utter extravagance. While the ones who are coming for the help are poor as church nice, handing over their last two talents and being told that their faith will exponentially increase the seed that they're sown. Mm -hmm. But where do those two talents go? That 20 bucks that was the last that they had in their bank account. It pads the pockets of these charlatans who are feeding lies and deceit. It, it reminds me of Timothy and what he said. I believe it's, uh, I think it's Second Timothy. Second Timothy chapter three. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty for people will be lovers of self, lovers of many, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid such people. And then he goes on to say that they're always learning and never able to come to arrive at the knowledge of the truth. And then there's, but there's another one too that I was looking for. Um, but just to touch on this, some key things to note is how they're having the appearance of godliness, but they're denying its power. How are they denying its power? What is it? When they're claiming God's power, how are they really denying it? They're denying it because they're trying to own his power themselves. By saying that they have the power in their own tongue. They have the power in their own words. That their words are what houses the power. That's how they deny it. It's, it's really nuanced. That's why it's so deceptive. Maybe it was First Timothy too. Well, of course, we know, you know, Second Timothy chapter... For, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myth. As for you, here we go again, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. What part of that right there gives any inclination that we're out there able to decree and that our words is what has power? To do what we wish with them. Because God gave us authority. It doesn't exist. I'm going to go jump over to First Timothy because maybe I can find it over here. First Timothy chapter 4. 
Now, the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence and from foods that God created, blah, blah, blah. That's kind of <clears throat> a contextual thing. But notice that he points out that through the insincerity of liars whose conscience are seared. That's a bold statement. And yet, as we look around, we can see all of these people devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. And their conscience will get seared. You know, in the chapters leading up to this, it talks about how the Lord desires for none to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Which is the only way to gain salvation, right? You have to repent. But the common teaching is that forgiveness doesn't require repentance. What's another thing that they're always parroting? You must forgive. You must forgive. You must forgive. Why do you think that is such a massive focal point for these types of ministries? It's rampant in their teaching. If somebody has an ailment, they're always, one of the first things they usually jump on is you must have unforgiveness in your heart. Or no faith. Yeah, no faith. Well, that's part of the faith aspect of it, too. Mm. Because if you don't get healed, then it's because your faith isn't strong. And a lot of times they'll throw in there, you, you have unforgiveness. You haven't repented of some sin. And... Their message is always, it's your fault. It's you that's the problem. It's not me. I'm the messenger from God. So if I come to you to heal you and you don't get healed, then there's something wrong with you. But when they talk about forgiveness, they never talk about forgiveness in a biblical way. They just tell you, you have to forgive. And what kind of an impression does that give people? You must forgive, you must forgive, you must forgive. First of all, it, it gives an underlying meaning That accountability is not something that we're supposed to be doing with each other. Because who is it that doesn't want accountability the most? The one with the microphone. I was going to say, it sets up a, you know, a grade out for all the prophets who are consistently wrong in their prophecies. Yep. And you have an abusive relationship, this kind of battered wife syndrome, always going back. Um, but it creates that that environment. It creates that type of relationship because you it know gives the, the person who's in the abusive relationship no out makes them feel like they're not allowed to leave it because if they leave it, then they're being unforgiving. And most of the people out there 
are abusing their constituents in a very subtle way. Some of them are pretty overt with it. <laughs> I mean, it's like they use abusive speech. Others look like the most loving people on the planet, but they're still giving you those underlying messages of, oh no, if you don't forgive, then God's going to do this to you. Whoever talks about what forgiveness really is supposed to look like, like, what is it? Yes, Jesus says, if you don't forgive, it won't be forgiven you. But what does that mean? How does that work? The only thing that we have that we can go to is what does it look like with the Lord? How does the Lord forgive? In order to be forgiven by the Lord, you must repent. Not say I'm sorry. Not give lip service. He knows our hearts. He knows when we mean it. Repentance is an action. It's not just a, a sentiment. You're literally turning away from it. You're agreeing that the actions were wrong and you and it is imperative to turn away from them 180 degrees and do what is now righteous and do what is right. So you walk back towards the Lord instead of away from him. And that's how relationships are restored. But the message, especially in these spheres or in any kind of a cult anywhere, the message is you must forgive which is actually saying you must not hold anybody accountable for their actions. You're not allowed to because that's unforgiving. And there's, it's so far from the truth. Are we supposed to harbor bitterness? No, we're not. So how is it that we can take the message of forgiveness and put it in the right context? We as people, we can judge the action and we can say that action is wrong. We can hold that person accountable, which is what we're supposed to do, which is right back to what is loving. Because if you allow somebody to, to remain in their sins, then you're handing them over to destruction, right? And you're killing them. You're allowing them to die. But if you hold them accountable, then the prayer, the hope, is that is what it says in Matthew 18, that prayerfully your brother will heed it and he will turn and he will be saved. And you will restore your brother. But if he doesn't, then you're supposed to go with some witnesses. And if that still doesn't work, then you're supposed to bring him before the congregation. And if that doesn't work, then he's not allowed to come into the congregation anymore. That's a, a loving act. It's been heavily defiled in the way that it's been implemented throughout the centuries. But when it's done with a true intention of, re, of restoring the brother, to what is true and right, or the sister, to what is true and right, and back on the path of repentance. Not to control them, but to actually free them. Then you can't get a more loving act than that. But if they wrong you, and they don't repent, what do we do with that? so that we don't harbor bitterness. It's basically taking that person 
you're putting up the boundaries. You're saying no. The relationship cannot be restored. It's impossible. If their transgressions against you are of such a nature that it creates that um, that severing, and it's usually because trust has been betrayed, safety has been compromised. They're not a safe person for you to be around because you cannot trust them. What they've done is of a grievous nature. And their actions are repetitive. You know, you can take that person, you can build those boundaries, and you can separate yourself from that person. And you can hand them to the Lord and say, I know you say vengeance is yours. Here's that person. I'm handing them over to you because you're the righteous judge. I've judged the actions. I've implemented what I can do. But now it's the Lord's job to sit on the judgment seat of them. And you pray and say, Lord, do what you have to do in their life. And that's when Paul talks about how you hand them over you basically handing them over to Satan for Satan to have his way with them and for the whole soul purpose in prayer that it will bring them to repentance. And that's what that looks like. Because you've gone through all the things that you could possibly go through to hopefully try to restore them to the truth and bring them to repentance. And if they refuse, they refuse and there's nothing you can do about that. But by no means does that ever mean that you remain in a relationship with them. Ever. They can no longer be part of your inner circle. They have to get pushed to the outskirts. Sometimes they have to be cut off altogether. And that's the case for really toxic people. And narcissistic people, which we have a plethora of these days, because that's like the spirit of the age, mm. is narcissism. Everything is so uh, self-focused and self-involved. And people are heavily entitled and enabled in their narcissism, thinking that your whole purpose in life is to serve them. And if you don't enable them, then you're the one who's being cruel. But nope, that's not how this works. Setting up a boundary with people is not something that is unloving, and it's definitely not something that is unforgiving. But that's the message that you will get in churches across the board. And you're right, Wade. I mean, that's how people um, are basically experiencing a secondary abuse and forced to stay in unsafe and unhealthy relationships because the church is now actually abusing them as well by not letting them escape, by not standing by them, by not holding the abuser accountable for their actions. Instead, they want to blame the one who is actually experiencing the abuse and say it's their fault. They're the ones who's not loving and kind and forgiving and gracious and merciful it's so backwards but all abuse is rooted in power and control the whole foundation of it is and these preachers and these 
so-called prophets and apostles and what have you. They got so many different names that they give themselves their own titles. They don't want to be held accountable. They don't want to be told they're wrong. They don't want to lose their position. That pedestal that they've placed themselves on. Those funds that keep pouring in because they have people con convinced that it's going to bring them blessings. To feed these religious influencers' lifestyles of grandiosity. They don't want to lose that. What's really interesting to me, here's a perfect example of the hypocrisy that these the hypocrisy that these preachers and, and religious celebrities, <laughs> for lack of a better term, walk in. Uh, take Todd White, for example. Here Todd White is professing to be the healer, right? He made that movie, The Holy Ghost, where he went all over the place supposedly healing all of these people and they're getting like these tingly sensations up their arms and blah, 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 blah. Legs are extending. Ailments supposedly are, are leaving them because of what Todd White's doing, right? But just recently, Todd White had to step down from ministry because he's having heart problems. So if he has this gift of healing to the point where what he believes and what he teaches is it's God wants to heal everybody because he loves everybody. So why is he now going through this? Where's that power for him? Why would he have to step down? Why can't he just do for himself what he does for everybody else? Where's his faith? How come it's not healing him? That's the contradiction of the whole thing. It doesn't add up. They claim all of these things, but it doesn't even work in their own lives. And I am in no way saying that miracles don't exist. I'm a firm believer in miracles. But the only person who's allowed to author a miracle is the Lord himself. If God wants a miracle to happen and he wants to use an individual to make that miracle happen, that person doesn't claim their own authority and their own gifting in order to make that happen based on their own opinion. God is the one who directs it. He goes first. He's the one who says, I want to do this with this person and I need you to go do X, Y, Z. And it is not something that is on the daily over and over and over and over and over again. Jesus healed many people. He did not heal everybody. And for us to have an expectation that everybody should be healed Everybody should walk in wholeness of life here on the earth, in prosperity here on the earth. That heaven is here on the earth with us because we bring it here. That's what they teach. We bring heaven down. And it abides here with us because we're in heaven and therefore heaven is here too. Which is why they live in these, these overwhelmingly Lavish, extravagant lifestyle. That's how they justify it. 
That's not how the Lord works. That's not how Jesus lives. No, I mean, what does Jesus say? He says, a twisted and perverse generation seeks after signs. And I always think of this example, and yeah, Jesus healed. Um, there was the, uh, the per- <laughs> there was lots of cri- crippled people. But there's a particular one that Jesus told them that his sins were forgiven. The Pharisees were standing by. And they were freaking out because they told him, well, only God has the power to forgive sins. And we know Jesus tells them, well, what's easier for me to say, that your sins are forgiven or to tell this man to pick up his bed and walk, but so that you may know that I am the Son of Man, I'm God, essentially. Then he turns to the guy, pick up your bed and walk. Kind of, we kind of gloss over the fact that the biggest miracle there for the crippled man was that his sins were forgiven. He got salvation. We also tend to forget (laughs) large portions of the New Testament written by Paul, who talks about the thorn in his flesh and the fact that God's strength is demonstrated in weakness. And so we have this perverted, twisted gospel that's run rampant through a lot of the Western world and has made its way into many other parts of the world that is a self-affirming and a catalyst that is like a it starts with the worship of self, and then, I mean, eventually it grows into doctrine that tells everyone they're Jesus or they're little Jesuses and, and that you are gods, essentially, and completely den- denying the fact that Christ, being fully man, fully God, humbled himself, emptied himself, and submitted even unto death. And that being a Christian, to have that mark, that name, means to imitate Christ. And Christ did nothing of his own will, but only the will of the Father. And so if we are imitating Christ, we're imitating that action. But that's not what's taught in the Western world. That's not what's taught in mainstream. And... A lot of it is intertwined uh, with what we've been taught from the world. You know, when the world teaches you to go at it on your own, be the best that you can be, follow your heart, follow your dreams, and when you say that on the surface, you're like, well, you know, what's wrong with that? So that gets mingled in with the church. Follow your heart, follow your dreams. And then we have all these institutions that really just mirror institutions and workings and ways of the world, just Christian. And some actually openly admit that they uh, model their churches after successful business practices. We have churches that have marketing teams. Yeah. And it becomes a... It's a business. Mm-hmm. I was actually a part of one that... Um, that's exactly what they said. It's a business. And I was like, What? Well, what's the goal of a business? And they thought that was a good thing. Yeah, make money. Yeah, you make a profit. Then your next quarter, you want to net more of a profit. And for for that, yeah, where, where God is uh, money or where your God is 
validated through these experiences or through the accumulation of wealth and riches, like that's affirmation for them and that's their reward. That's what they receive and that's affirming the belief. And people flock to it. It's what people want to hear. You don't want to hear about hardships. You don't want to hear about pain. You don't want to hear about the potential hazards, the potential alienation that you'll go through for trying to imitate the one who is supposed to be the savior of your life. And the whole point that Paul tries to get to in the epistles that Jesus is pointing to is we are not looking forward to anything here in the tangible, in this world. All our hope is in a heavenly kingdom. Mm-hmm. All our hope is, is not here. And so, yeah, he calls it, um, this is nothing but a shadow of what is to come. Here we see in part, like through a veil. So with all of the abuse, with all of the deception, and with all of the spiritual decay that is brought about by the twisting and contorting of doctrine, of the gospel, of the truth, with with people who have just found themselves coming out of it or are wanting to come out of it, what would you tell people how to go about doing that? Run. Get as far away from it as you can. Um, and know why you're doing it. Are you really wanting the Lord? Or are you wanting the... Um, the community that you've been involved with. If you really want God, and you really want to serve Him, renounce everything that you've done in that realm and ask the Lord to grant you the discernment to see the truth from the air so that you can repent of the air and you can embrace and you can turn towards the truth and you can walk in it wholeheartedly. Find your grounding in the Lord alone first. Start diving into scripture with a critical eye and ask the Lord to give you his lens and help you hear things and see things and and perceive what scripture is saying based on what the Lord says is true versus what all of these teachers have told you. It's not an easy task. And sometimes you have to step away from everything for a bit. I know for me, going through spiritual abuse, It was extremely hard to even read the Bible because I couldn't read the words without hearing it through the lens of the abuse that I went through. And it felt like abuse all over. It was tormenting. And just trust and know that God knows. When you're trying to flee from anything like this, 
that is so distorted, it has basically defiled scripture in order to keep you towed along to their their string so that they can have control over you and, and you are a puppet of theirs. You're trying to break free from that. Start writing things down. Start questioning everything. What does God actually say versus what these people said? What does the Lord actually say about the, a, a certain belief? And investigate it throughout all of Scripture, not cherry-picking. And all of Scripture, I mean from Genesis through Revelation, find everywhere that the Lord discusses something like that. For example, this whole thing about uh, being drunk in the spirit. What does the Lord say about that? What does the Lord say about healings? What does the Lord say about miracles? What does the Lord say about our authority? What does he actually have to say about that? What does he actually say about how he wants to be worshipped? What does he actually say about what is important to him? Not what somebody said is important to him. What would the purpose be of gold dust? How does that glorify God at all? How does that cause people to repent and turn from their evil and wicked deeds and face him? And walk towards him. How does gold death do that? How do gems do that? And who saw this gold death? And who has these gems? How many people actually did come to the Lord in that this conference or that conference or this gathering or that gathering? How do you know? What about the healing? How do you know they were actually healed? Who kept in touch with them? Who's walked alongside them and seen the, the longevity of that healing? Questions. And questions and questions. Everything. Not like in a neurotic way, but in a way because you are now Seeking truth. The Lord says people perish because they love not the truth. He wants you to love truth more than loving a gathering, more than loving a feeling, more than loving an emotion, more than loving a teaching, more than loving a teacher as benevolent as they may appear and humble as they may present themselves to be. The Lord calls us to love him more than anybody else. He who loves father and mother, children, husband, wife, more than me is not worthy of me, is what the Lord says. And I understand this is a harsh reality. This is a harsh and difficult truth to hear. Because it's very lonely. But if you are in that situation, if you know that the Lord is speaking to you right now and he's revealing it to you right now and you're there, you have people you can reach out to for support. Because I'm not saying do this alone. I'm just saying love God first. Seek Him first. And trust in Him. 
But if you need support and you need people to walk alongside you and help you navigate through all the webs that have you ensnared in your mind and in your spirit, because what is real? What is true? How does this work? There are people who are willing to do that. I am one of them. I would be more than happy to listen and to help in any way that I can. Because it is very challenging when you're deep into it to try to figure out what God really says in truth and not with the words and the interpretations that have been pounded into you. And a lot of times it's with a kiss. To keep you from the truth. But if you love it, then it will make itself known to you. Because the truth is alive. The truth is a being. It's not a subjective perception. It's an objective, unchangeable, unwavering, solid rock foundation that will never shift. It's a who is truth question. And what does he say? Right now, the message in the world is that we're able to define our own truth. Everything's relative. And to claim objective truth is to be intolerant. The most intolerant thing you can do is allow somebody to live in a reality that doesn't exist. To allow somebody to believe in a fantasy, in a fairy tale of their own making just because that's what they like and that's what feels good to them. Objective truth doesn't care about your opinion. It is not Something that is defined by anybody's perception. It is what it is and it will never change. It is what it is despite the amount of people that reject it. It can't cease being what it is. And to know that there is such a thing as absolute objective truth out there is the most comforting thing. Because we know that if it exists, we have a hope that we can find it. And he's waiting to be found. Knock and the door shall be opened to you. Seek and you shall find. Because he stands at the door and he knocks. And he's there desiring greatly for you to turn your gaze off of everything that is glittery around you. 
and look him square in the eyes and see him for who he is and not what somebody else claimed him to be. His arms are open wide. And he's ready to help. There's a lot of wood, hay, and stubble that's going to have to get burned off. But the love of truth will bring forth the endurance and the perseverance to keep you going headlong in the right direction. There will be grieving. That's okay. It's part of the process. He doesn't promise ease. Whenever we're caught in a world of deception, it's always grieving when we learn what the truth is. Wisdom does bring many sorrows. But who would not rather live with wisdom and know that the wisdom in which they live in will last for all eternity versus living in a in a, a false joy that is nothing but a vapor and will be completely destroyed. We're called to run the race. There's a lot of booby traps along the way. But one thing that I want people to hear and know, just because you fell into this does not mean in any way that you're stupid. There's nothing to feel guilty about. Deception on this level is So good, it can get the most discerning of hearts. But if you're hearing it now that you know that this isn't right and this isn't true, and you are knowing that you need to turn from it, that right there is you loving God and you listening to the true discernment he's already given you, and you do have it. None of us, not a one, is above deception. We are human, and we will always err. But when the Lord brings that correction, praise him. Thank him. And run to him. Guilt and shame will only beat you down and try to keep you from him. It comes from the enemy. The enemy will condemn you. The enemy will make you feel foolish. You're not. The enemy is the one who made you believe in a deception. It is him who desired for you to believe in that deception. Now he wants to blame you for it? No. That can be rebuked in the name of Jesus and by the power of his blood. You do not need to listen to any of that. The Lord does not come to condemn. He comes to set free. Guilt, shame, condemnation, those are shackles. They never bring freedom. Godly sorrow does. 
we will feel sorrow for some of the things that we've done. Absolutely. Every time we sin, we feel, hopefully feel godly sorrow. Because that leads us to repentance. And that godly sorrow is that reminder to hopefully keep us from doing it again. So we continue to walk in the fruits of that repentance, just as Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7 as well. But remember what he also says in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. Many will say, Lord, Lord. Many will perform miracles, heal the sick, cast out demons, prophesy in his name. They will do these things, and those things will be real. Just as we talked about in Deuteronomy chapter 13, they will do these things. The person who prophesied, the dreamer of dreams, it comes to pass. But the next thing that Jesus says in that passage of Matthew chapter 7 is he will say, depart from me. I never knew you. And they'll argue with him. But didn't we do all of these things in your name? And he tells them he never knew them. And he says, you who practice lawlessness. And that is what is pervasive. The practice of lawlessness. Just because you say, Lord, Lord, just because you heal, just because you prophesy, just because you're able to do miracles, does not mean you know the Lord. Does not mean any of them know the Lord Do not trust people just because you see them perform something. You will know them by their fruits. And if their fruits preach a different gospel, if their fruits require you to follow after different gods, like the ones of Hinduism, where you're cackling and hackling and... and flopping around thinking that it's the Holy Spirit that's following after other gods and worshiping them. Through the false name of Jesus. That's a different Jesus. That's not the true one. And there are many. Just as Jesus, Yeshua, Al Mashiach, just as he says. There is only one Jesus of Nazareth. And he calls all of those things an abomination. Because they do not come from him. But it is an adultery with other gods. But I know that there's going to be people right now who are listening to this who are, know that they have to turn. And my prayers are for you. My greatest prayer is that the Lord surround you. The Lord comfort you. That he bring you peace. And yet, make you uncomfortable just enough to keep you driving in that opposite direction. So that you drive towards him. In his truth. The gifts are real. The gifts still exist. 
There's no need to throw the baby out with the bathwater just because the gifts have been defiled. And it is possible to take that pendulum that swings so far from one side to the other in such extremes. And it is possible to get close to that plumb line. So you are on that solid rock foundation. And you're not being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine that comes from seducing spirits. It is possible. And it is our goal and it is our aim to walk in as the body of Christ. And to help each other with. So we continue on that narrow path. So we can enter into that narrow gate. Have hope. Have courage. You're not alone. There are many other around you. You just might not know their name. But as I sit right now, I, I'm praying for each and every one of you that the Lord leads. Because I can see him doing it. Do not be discouraged when it gets hard. Press into him. Read throughout scripture. All the time, things get hard. Find comfort in those that you can identify with. The Psalms is a great place. Jeremiah in the Kings with Elijah, Job, Paul, and of course our Savior. Because there's nothing that you can go through That he didn't walk through first. And if you're thinking that Jesus was never deceived, did not Satan try to deceive him in the wilderness? He just didn't fall into it. He did it perfectly. He's God. We're not. We're flesh. We're human. But he showed us the way, how to do it. And that he's with us, which is why he doesn't condemn us. So correct us, he will not condemn us. Because he knows. He knows what the battle is like. So fear not. He's with you. And so is his body. And one day we will all be together again. One day we will be able to see each other face to face. And we'll be able to worship him together. In community. And we will be able to glorify his name. In unison. And if we can keep our eyes focused heavenward and not on this world, that is where your strength will lie. Because nobody can take that away. Anything that happens down here on the earth pales in comparison to the kingdom to come. And if we can make our end goal heavenward, And that is the only way that our race will be done. It's not in any goal that we make down here. It's not in how many people we can convince to repent. It's not in how many people we can lead to the, the Lord through the gospel. It's not about numbers. It's about doing what he's called us to do while we're here and knowing 
where we're going. Because we have zero control over anybody else. Every single person is a free will agent. They will choose what they choose. And they cannot be our objective to ensure that our goal is to make it happen. You will be utterly disappointed. And your face will get rocked. And my prayer is that none of you lose your faith. Even though you, you may feel at times you don't have any. Just remember, he's faithful even when we're not. And praise God for that. Because he can't be anything else but what he is. And if he's going to be the author and the finisher of our faith, then we can trust him. Even when everything inside of us feels like we're completely dead. And there's nothing left. All who are handed into the hands of the Son by the Father They're not going to get snatched away. We still have a response and we have our responsibility and our, our duties here. But continue to follow his commandments. Continue to live a life in accordance with his word. And seek him above all things. And truth will be found. And heavenward will always be our home.